I'm Mary Holtz Claus, and we are so honored that um, we have this forum today so that we can have a discussion with uh, Provost Gable. This is truly a momentous occasion for the university history because for only the 17th time since 1851, the University of Minnesota is searching for its next president. Now we know from the gubernatorial that they're having 41, so to only have had 17 presidents here. At the start of the search, as you'll recall, the search advisory committee we, uh, visited all of the campuses across the system to gather input from all of you about what you wanted to see in the next president. And now that, in, that input, um, after a tremendous amount of impact and deliberations, ultimately brought us Provost Gable to campus here today. And so now we're back to where it all started, uh, getting input from the university commun community Provost Gable is traveling to all five campuses before her interview with the Board of Regents on Friday morning, and this is one of those five public forums. After the forum today, please provide your input to the Board of Regents on the Presidential Search website. There are cards at the back of the theater auditorium for you to provide your public input. So before we actually go forward with the forum, uh, just a few uh, moments about how we're going to be running our forum today. President Gable will first make a few remarks, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to have questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please write your question on a note card and give it to either Chris or Elizabeth or Cassandra, and then um, Matt Kramer, who is here from the Vice President for uh, Public Relations and Community Relations, will be um, looking through those and then providing us those questions. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our finalist for the position of the University of Minnesota's 17th president, Joan T. A. Gable. This, uh, Dr. Gable currently serves as executive vice president for academic affairs and provost at the University of South Carolina, a position that she's held since 2015. She was previously the dean of the University of, Min of Missouri's True Less College of Business, and prior to that, she held faculty and administrative positions at Florida State University and Georgia State University. Gable earned her bachelor degree in philosophy from Haverford College in Pennsylvania and her JD from the University of Georgia. She and her husband, Gary, have three, three children, a daughter who lives and works in Seattle, a son who's a junior in college, and a son who's a junior in high school. Please join me in welcoming Provost Gable. Thank you so much, everybody, especially because I know this is your finals period and a very busy time on campus, but so delighted and grateful to see everyone here today. I have to thank a few people before we get into the heart of the matter. I, I'm very grateful to the Board of Regents for inviting me to be able to have this experience with you and take this time to talk to you. Very grateful to the search committee for the work that they've done in getting all of us to this point. Very grateful to all of you who provided input during the listening sessions and feedback process. And very grateful to all of you who would show up here today and take your afternoon so that I can learn about what's going on here in Crookston and share some of the ideas that I have about what our shared opportunities are for the future. I'm so honored and humbled to have this chance. There's an incredible amount of good news and reason for optimism for this university, for the university as a system, for this campus, for Greater Missouri, for the state as a whole, and how all of that fits together gives me really, really high levels of excitement about what the opportunity to be president of this university means. And to work with a chancellor like the chancellor you have here is also really a part of the tremendous attraction for being able to explore this opportunity. So I don't want to take too much time making remarks. What I really want to use the time for is hearing from you. And I saw note cards coming up already. So with that said, I think maybe we would just get started on Q&A and see what it is you'd like to know and give me the opportunity to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can actually read now. So <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those age things, you know. <laughs> I have to own I have up them to them it. too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I know that there's some questions that are uh, being accumulated right now, but um, I was going to ask you if you could, as we're waiting for some of us to come, if you could give us your views on the importance 
or not, of providing access for university students? Oh, uh, importance would be, if not one of the highest, the highest of the core mission of what it means, I think, to be a public university, and in particular, a public land grant. When you think about what the uh, core attributes of the Morrill Act were, they were to create learning and research environments with physical offices around the state so that the work of the university elevated in every corner of the state. And if in those days, that was very clearly anchored in agribusiness engineering, which of course it still is as its cornerstone core mission in agribusiness and engineering. But when you think about elevation and what it means for a university campus, what it means for a university system, and what it means for extension offices to elevate and create opportunities, the very obvious corollary to that, what comes after the comma, if you will, is that means that students could get here, that students can engage in what it is we have to offer, that they come here and they are themselves elevated and then they go out into the state and do their good work and live a life well lived in a fulfilling way using the tools, skills, competencies, sense of community, sense of service that we provide them. So if we're not fulfilling our access mission as hard as it is, and it is hard, then I think we're missing one of the very core attributes of what it was we were le legally created to do. Thank you. So we hear a lot about the value of higher education these days, and people are really questioning it. How do you respond to that when people say to you, was it really worth it to go to college anymore? You know, I, I, I think when you work in higher education, I'm not, I, I just have to assume the chancellor would see this too. It, you just can't believe people even ask that question, right? I mean, how can you question the value of higher education? But we also have the luxury of being in it, right? So we see students come in to us and go out transformed. We see what it's like for a faculty member to have the experience of a really great class or to engage in a type of research that really answers a question or to uh, work with a partner in the community that really helps them solve a problem or all of the other things that we could describe about what we do. So I'm always surprised by that question, but it is a question that comes from all corners of the country and from a lot of different constituencies. So how do you answer that question? Well, there's a two-dimensional answer to that question, and I think there's a three-dimensional answer to that question. And the two-dimensional answer is the data is really clear that engaging in higher education improves your job prospects and your earning potential. I think that is, a, at the cornerstone, a, a sort of return on investment answer to that question. And at universities like this one, campuses like this one, systems like this one, what you do for local business and how you impact local community or how this campus is a part of a conversation about greater Minnesota is documentable, measurable, and you can see how it impacts economically in terms of economic development. So that's a nice, easy way to answer the question. And sometimes you can stop there because that's hard data and pretty compelling. But I think it's incumbent upon us as educators, students, faculty, and staff, community partners, people who work in different parts of the university, people who work in local government surrounding the university, people who work in all different parts of the campus, to remember that part of what makes a society work well, part of what makes all of the wheels turn, is the ability to think about what it is that you're doing, the ability to take complicated information and synthesize it, communicate it, critically analyze it, be a participant in a conversation about difficult issues, make difficult decisions, evaluate risk about what it is you might want to do. And I think that some people are able to find those competencies without higher education, but I think higher education is an across the board accelerator and catalyzer of that portfolio of skills and competencies and really helps us make large portions of society able to live a life well lived. And so I see, I just, I don't understand why everybody doesn't know that. <laughs> so. Thank you. So, 
What role do you see uh, for athletics on the four of the five campuses? What role does it play? Yeah, so I've said, and of course this is the sort of thing that when you do a conversation like this and there are media in the room, is the first thing that gets quoted is I'm myself a terrible athlete. So now that it's, now that it's out there, I guess I'll go ahead and repeat it. Um, somehow I produced children who are very good athletes. And so over the course, but I went to a very small school that had um, intramural and division three athletics, but athletics was a, a part of the life, but not like you would see um, in some schools like what you see on the Twin Cities campus or hockey in Duluth and, and, and some of the, where it really is, uh, it, it, was, it was a component, I would describe it that way. So uh, I'm a fan, I enjoy attending sports. We all know I grew up in the South, it's a big part of life in, in the um, part of the country where I grew up. The big sports in Atlanta when I was growing up were of course football, mostly high school football, Friday night lights kind of thing. And you may be surprised to hear hockey because the Atlanta Flames, which are now the Calgary Flames, were in Atlanta when I was a girl. And so part of your um, major sports entertainment in Atlanta at that time included hockey. And so I've been, I went to hockey games a lot. And then when the Flames moved to Calgary, a minor league team moved in, the, which was called at the time the Gwinnett Gladiators. And now they're the Atlanta Gladiators a few years later. And I took my children to those games. So they love hockey too. Uh, and then I spent a year in Canada as a student and had collegiate hockey for the first time, which was really fun. So uh, that was a big part of my life. And so I understand the value of being a fan. I understand how attending athletic events brings people together. You have, you have everybody in a contained space uh, on, on uh, impassioned, I think would be the right way to describe it. And so as higher education institutions that have college athletics, it's what we would call a front porch opportunity. It's not uh, a good idea if it's not run well. It needs to be run well, needs to keep the students safe, needs to create academic opportunities for the students, needs to align with the strategic goals of the institution, and then needs to be a nice front porch way for people to stay in touch with, happy about, reminded of their passion for the university, and reminded about how the university does a lot of other things too. And so the value of having people excited about athletics gives you a platform to make them excited about a lot of other things and there are a lot of other things to be excited about. Great, thank you. We Golden Eagles are excited yes. to hear that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, knowing that the University of Minnesota Crookston is a leader in delivering online degree programs, how do you see online education at the university strategically? So I, I, I'll tell a story. I taught for, how many of you have taught online? Of course, so a lot. I taught my first online class in 1998. So I'd like to consider myself um, an early mover in online instruction. And in those days, some of you will remember, you coded it yourself, which meant it was coded badly in my case, but you did code it yourself. And you, um, you emailed students what you wanted them to read. And there was no Blackboard, there was no Canvas, there were none of the platforms that we use. And when you did engage students in instruction, it was a scrolling chat, which our students in the room and anyone under the age of, I don't want to list an actual number, don't even know what I'm talking about, right? It's such a, we've come so far since then. And upon reflection, that type of instruction really did not have a high level of academic quality, but it did create opportunity, right? And we saw how you could reach students who otherwise couldn't get to you, whether it was physically or because they had obligations, whether they be work obligations, familial obligations. It, you could see the potential of the technology to create cost savings, whether it meant that there were certain fees you didn't have to charge or whether you could actually deliver content. In certain environments, it allows you to open up bottlenecks if you have um, the reverse of capacity in certain courses, you can offer things off schedule, you can offer things asynchronously, and we all mm -hmm. saw some opportunities there. And one of the things that I think is underappreciated about online or distributed learning education is you can offer content that might not fill a classroom in a low enough cost way that you can still make that content available. So sometimes people wanna offer a boutique elective and they just run it asynchronously and students come in and out and you can make it work fiscally and then give students access to that content, which is a wonderful thing. And at the end of the day, there's a demand for it. And so when you're looking at capacity and enrollment management, 
it makes perfect sense to explore it as part of your strategy. But I think that it's, it has the happy benefit of creating an enrollment management opportunity, but it also has so many other benefits that I know we're already starting to explore, but I see that there's still potential that could be explored and fulfilled. Thank you. What does the University of Minnesota system mean to you? For instance, should all classes automatically transfer between universities? Should the universities share the names of non-admitted students with their other uh, regional universities? So if you could talk a little bit about what does system this mean? Yes. Is, is there so such a word, system I think we can say okay. there is a word, system systemness. <laughs> we will claim that word. Okay. How about that? Uh, I think it's a word. How about <laughs> Does that count? I don't know. So, uh, I'll talk about the specific examples you offered, and then I'll talk in a wider sense, broader perspective about what systemness means to me. So um, I've worked in the system, and the system I'm in now shares the names of non-admitted students in a pretty efficient way. It, it, it can always be smoother and faster, which would, of course, benefit everyone, but it works pretty well. And it has, when it works well, yielded for um, our, the other campuses in the system. So there is a shared uh, willingness and desire to make it better and better year over year. It's a process, and I, but one that I think over time everyone has become comfortable with, uh, which took a little time, but we're, we're pretty close to being there in what that means. In terms of course transfers, I worked for a few years in the Florida system where every course has to be approved by uh, a central office. It can be very bureaucratic. It can slow down creativity. I think there is value in, in a selective strategy around course transfers working smoothly. Uh, it is difficult to create uniqueness campus by campus when every course has to exist everywhere. How that balances in a system like this or whether my personal opinion would be um, balanced out by a collective wisdom that says to the contrary, I think that's what shared governance is about and I think that's where systemness comes in, is in a reflection of how you look at a, a group of people, programs, institutions, communities, and a state that is very different in different places, but yet shares the same overarching shared goal of being a system that fulfills its core mission of elevation across all of those constituencies, mm -hmm. but also wants to develop a unique contribution in its local community that can translate around the state, but is anchored. And so that's a, a horizontal and a vertical, if you want to think about it that way. And systemness would be making it more of a sphere and how all of that communicates across, how you communicate with each other, how you invest in and recognize uniqueness, but look at how it contributes to a togetherness and a collective impact. And that to me is shared governance. That's getting different perspectives around a table, figuring out what you want to accomplish, and then figuring out how you would actually go from where you are now to where you want to be. Thank you. Can you grab some water there? Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, if you could share with us your vision for leading an institution with both urban and rural campuses and communities. Mm -hmm. Some experience with this, although I will say the systems with which I've had the good fortune of working before, none of them had a campus within a major metropolitan area that was the the big campus. So um, in the Missouri system, there are, are campuses in St. Louis and Kansas City, which are of course major metropolitan areas, but they were comprehensive campuses. And then the large campus sits in Columbia, Missouri, which is a small, well, on the small end of mid-sized city is how I, I think it would be described by our social scientists in the room. So the, uh, the and that's different. It creates a different feeling, it creates a different set of constituencies, each campus defines its service a little differently, but it's actually one of the things that I like about the University of Minnesota, how it has thoughts and ideas that are relevant to the kind of global impact research that comes very clearly out of the Twin Cities campus, but also in different ways out of every other campus, but has a real sense of state and place that each campus has and the extension offices have and how that fits together in ways where if you read something like a position profile that is sent to me as a potential candidate, it says things about what it means to serve the state as a whole, be, be 
fortunate bearer of a global reputation and also be able to say, here's how we affect this community right here. And it fits together and actually makes sense rather than being kind of a tug of war between those things. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't require a stewardship and a nurturing and an ongoing conversation, but that's what this university brings to the table. And it's, well, I, it's, we talked about this earlier. I, I can't think of anyone else that could say that that way. Thank you. Um, the research enterprise at the mm -hmm. University of Minnesota, $900 million, a billion dollars, it's, it's a large research enterprise. Yes, it is. Um, could you talk a little bit about ways that you can maybe see that here, and we spoke about this uh, earlier, we had an opportunity to, uh, to speak with uh, Margot as the faculty senate representative and Tim Dudley as the faculty um, uh, union representative and Dr. Hoffman and myself. And so we spoke a little bit about uh, the research enterprise here on campus. So if you could speak a little bit, if you have any thoughts or ideas about how we could strengthen the relationship so that we can strengthen more research um, that happens here. There's a lot that certainly happens with undergraduate research. Mm -hmm. our, our faculty are very involved with that, but also have a desire to be, to be more greatly involved. Yes, so that's uh, one of the, I think, it, system specific and system unique advantages is that because the enterprise is so competitively successful, it creates the potential for an economy of scale that other research institutions or systems that have a highly research productive uh, partner within the system but are themselves struggling may not be able to share and use the shared service model in order to allow faculty to be able to participate in the same way. It's a little difficult to give an aggregate answer to that question because each person's individual research and the type of extramural support they would likely pursue is going to vary a lot. But what I heard very clearly from the Vice President for Research the first day that I was here is that he has a system mentality. He wants to make sure that what's happening so successfully in the Twin Cities is scalable where appropriate, relevant to the research interests of the faculty, not as a question of um, a forced change in research trajectory, but as an incentivized attribute of a research faculty member's um, decision-making process as they feel creative, as they explore innovation, as they want to discover, they could say to themselves, well, I know there's this program and maybe that would accelerate or create an investment in, but maybe that's not the direction I wanna go in, so I'll do it this way instead being fine. So it would be incentivized rather than forced. So I have a question here. Um, and what are your views about ways we as a university system can change the social climate around sexual misconduct? Uh, so I know this has been a very challenging and painful conversation um, on the Twin Cities campus and really every campus recently, but of course, as we all know, this is a national conversation and a very difficult one. And uh, one of the things that as I was exploring the possibility of this opportunity a, a few months ago in the very earliest phases that I came across when I was doing my homework was the way in which the uh, Twin Cities campus faculty are looking at sexual assault from a public health lens and thinking about it as an epidemic and what you do as scientists, clinicians, community members, uh, students, faculty, and staff about an epidemic and using what we know about that to try to create prevention and starting there. So the emphasis on prevention, everyone would say that. The room nods its head when you say that, but looking at things that we know work to try to get at prevention because the best outcome, really the only acceptable outcome would be we prevent it at all. That should be the goal is that it doesn't happen, right? So we work on that as a cornerstone. Now, in recognition that we aren't there yet and that unfortunately it does still happen, then what are the resources for um, mental health support, for counseling, for education, for identification so that we can channel people who are affected into the resources? I think we often do a good job of finding resources, don't always do a, as good a job about communicating the availability of resources because this is not something that you study unless you have a personal connection and by the time you have a personal connection you're in crisis and so making sure that we're allies to victims so that they can find what we need what they need and we're making it available and then we have what may be in, in at least today one of the most challenging attributes of this conversation which is this moving target in compliance 
because Title IX is changing in real time and we had new guidance issued and guidance makes it sound voluntary when we know that it's not. We knew rules issued a few weeks ago, and we as university campuses are trying to figure out what that means for us and getting legal advice, developing press practices, shifting uh, processes and procedures. But the reality is that the changes in Title IX in terms of investigation should not and do not in any way legally, otherwise, morally, ethically affect our efforts in prevention and our efforts in providing the right kind of services and being allies to victims. Thank you. So, a recent Star Tribune article on you highlighted your commitment to diversity in students as well as faculty. I'd like to hear more about your beliefs and what you've done to correct inequities. I, thank you, I would love to talk about that. So uh, I think just as a point of contextualization, it's worth mentioning that the history of South Carolina or uh, the Southeast, but specifically South Carolina is different than the history here. Um, and what has been part of um, everyone's challenged or painful history ha it has some geographic uh, components that, are, that should be recognized and really brought forward and overtly recognized so that you can move in a way that makes sense for place and where you are and context. So some of what I'm going to say is specific to that, but some of it I really believe is translatable. So there are things about um, proactive strategies in diversity and inclusion that have become best practices across university campuses, changes in how we do recruiting, changes in how we set compositional targets for the representative nature of our students, faculty, and staff. All of us are doing that within the appropriate constraints or opportunities, communities in which we live, types of students we serve, and that's great. So we're seeing some impact from those changes on almost every campus. But where we're really seeing things emerge is uh, what we're doing for students once they arrive in order to ensure a, a sense of belonging and every opportunity for success. And those two go hand in hand, but they're not exactly the same thing and what we're doing to try and draw faculty to a campus and then retain them who create a sense of belonging and have what they need for their success. And those are not exactly the same thing, but they go hand in hand. And how we're partnering with our community partners, local community partners, large corporations, and everything in between who have also developed their own best practices on how to create inclusive, successful climates that we can learn from because I do think we have the risk in higher education of a little bit of an echo chamber and thinking that what we're doing, let's, you know, let's give it a try and see if it's working when there are other people who are doing it in different constituencies who've had some success that we could frankly cherry pick and, and incorporate into the unique attributes of our environment. And so what has that meant at the University of South Carolina is we've restructured recruitment both in who's doing the recruiting and what they're saying the types of high schools they're working with. We're doing more campus visit early, all the way down into sixth grade, so that we can demystify the higher education experience for people who may not have any familiarity with it. I'll broadly say first generation, but that can mean a lot of different things depending on where you are and the constituencies that you serve. Then we're looking at faculty and staff composition, but also what they are saying and doing so that they're um, eliminating as much as one can implicit bias in how they're engaging in classroom instruction, but also identifying so that students can see themselves in their faculty when the faculty want to, that's completely voluntary. But as an example, we've asked faculty who are first generation to wear a pin. They don't have to, but as you might imagine, everyone who is has asked for one. They've asked for multiple so they can put it on every jacket so they don't have to remember to put it on in the morning. And the faculty, we've have now had a movement of faculty who are not first gen, but who want to show that they're allies and they're creating a pin for that too. And what that means to a student who may not know when they're looking up at the front of the classroom that, for example, the president of the University of South Carolina who went to Yale is himself first gen means so much. <laughs> it means so much in terms of finding yourself where you are and feeling the support and inclusion and sense of belonging in the environment. So we've done those sorts of things. We've worked very closely in a very inclusive way with faculty, staff, and students on advisory councils, community advisory councils. And we've really tried to leverage what we think is unique about higher education, which is people who know a lot about something and students who are curious 
to create things like forums, speakers, experiences that build on the strength of the subject matter expertise of our faculty or community partners and the curiosity of our entire community, especially our students, but really everyone, so that we can have informed discussions about hard topics so that you form your opinion as you are absolutely entitled to do, but with information and context and really respect and civility. And I really think that's part of how you contribute to society and a democracy in general. Thank you. This is probably a shorter answer. Um, sorry. No, no, that's good. I care a lot no, about good. that. That's, that one you care a lot about, and we appreciate that. So noted, I'll give, noted. No, I'll give you a moment to rest here, is what I meant by that. In your opinion, what is more important when admitting a student, the ACT, SAT score, or high school GPA? Uh, so that will depend who you ask, right? So I have admissions within our own admissions team at South Carolina where uh, you sometimes think it might go somewhere in that conversation that it probably shouldn't go in the impassioned opinion of experts in admissions about the difficulty in that subject. So I think, and I know this is a little bit of a hedge, but I think you answer that question with thought about your mission. I don't know if it's as much about the student as it is about what your institution wants to do with and for your students that you would answer that question because the data is mixed and reflects different types of goals for how you would predict student success as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So when you're serving large numbers of students, it's very difficult to ignore ACT scores because when you have to, by definition, deal in aggregate decision making, in the aggregate, it is a reflection of potential for future success. And so you consider it in that way. But when you're looking at scale, bigger or smaller, I think it makes perfect sense to balance those according to what you consider your mission to be or how you execute on your mission that is specific to the community you serve. And so I think that what you should do in answering that question is look at who you are as an institution who you want to serve, how you think you best serve them, and then use what we know about those two uh, points and figure out what to do. I'll tell you just as an aside, um, I won't say uh, which one of my children, but one of my children is a much better standardized test taker than grade earner, and I have one of my children who is the reverse. And so, uh, you know, everyone has their data point on that, that their own child, uh, a neighbor, a friend, you know, this amazing child who was really good at one and not the other. And you, you hate the idea of a loss of opportunity because they're not data points, they're people. <laughs> and they really want them to be successful. And so it's a mission alignment process, I think, is how admissions comes to how you would choose between those two. Thank you. So this uh, question asks, and I think you've answered it, some of it, but should we keep the regional campuses open? If so, why or why not? And what role do they play? Yeah, and if it's any consolation, uh, this is a conversation that happens in every system in the entire United States of America. If it's not keeping them open organization or how you would figure out and how all of it works together, and actually I think it's a good thing to ask yourself those questions because it's part of what we need to do in higher education now to be able to explain what your value proposition is. And the, the good news is it's very easy to explain here. So uh, I think that there is a clear contribution being made by every single one of the campuses in this system in unique ways in where they are located or in what they do or both and in what they contribute up to the system and how the system works together across each other, other campuses through the Twin Cities back out across every other campus. And I think that is very closely partnered with Extension in every single county and how Extension is working together. And so I think that what then needs to happen is a very clear set of goals for systemness, <laughs> which is a word, <laughs> and that goal set is articulated so that everyone could talk about it, that it's the kind of thing that when you're in a local community meeting, whatever that means in the community in which you find yourself, you can explain it so that when the question is asked, it can be answered and not just be assumed to speak for itself. Thank you. Thank you. So what is the role of the University of Minnesota in addressing the greater Minnesota cities divide? Mm. So one of the greatest advantages that we talked about earlier in the structure between the major metropolitan area and greater Minnesota 
is also one of the hardest things to actually operationally navigate is the relationship between the two. And I would say, even in my extremely short observation, we say greater Minnesota, but it's not all the same either, and how you figure out what that means in different parts of the state, which is true in every state that has um, a, a, a land grant, or, or for every university that sits in the state where that university has a land grant mission, I would posit, just in different ways. And so I think that the uh, one of the real assets of the University of Minnesota is in the fact that it has already, whether it was organically or purposefully, over time evolved into layers that are synergistic and make sense. So you have a research enterprise in the Twin Cities that engages in research that absolutely is for the benefit of the state, but also engages in research on that campus and others that have a global impact. And it's okay for there to be different avenues of impact as long as you are thoughtful about it and look at how it all fits together. I see it as a huge advantage, not a threat and not a tension, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to take care of it and make sure that you understand the balance and that it doesn't get too far out of balance because if you're not serving each of those constituencies, engaging in each of those constituencies, it's a lost opportunity because we know we can we know we have the human intellectual capital to do it, the passion to do it, the physical locations around the state to do it, and now we have to do it <laughs> and figure out a way to do it that makes sense within a constrained resource environment. Okay. I need to have your cards. Does anybody have any more questions here? So, no. I, I, This is usually not such a quiet group, so I'm sure that they have a few <laughs> over there. Thank you. Thank you. So. So what has been your most rewarding experience as an academic administrator? I, you know, I've been very lucky to do things that really you can only do in higher ed, like go to places around the world that are amazing and meet really interesting people. And my own research has been very fulfilling. But for me, the most amazing thing is when you see a student who has a light bulb turn on. I don't think there's any substitute for that. I don't think anybody realizes how amazing that is if they've never had the chance to experience it. And I have said multiple times over the course of my career and multiple times in the last 48 hours, if you're worried about the future, if you, there's a lot of tough stuff going on right now, spend a little time with a few students, you will feel better, <laughs> you will be renewed in your optimism. So to me, the most fulfilling part, I mean, we've launched some programs, we've done some real multiplier things. It's all my CV and you can look at it, but, but the real, this is why we're here, is all about the students. So, could you give us a few moments to tell us about your research? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> is anybody sleepy? <laughs> <laughs> anybody have insomnia? I can help you with that. So, um, I'm actually a lawyer by training, and I practiced law for a few years. I think that's where the non-traditional, traditional conversation um, comes from sometimes. And I did move out of applied work, representing clients, into higher education onto a tenure track and that, but in a business school, which is a little unusual, but I'm certainly not the only person who's ever done it. Uh, and, and in fact, my, one of my most important mentors was a lawyer in a business school, not surprisingly. And he is now the president of another large research university. So the, uh, the uh, work that I did was informed by the area of practice that I did. So, when I was practicing law, I worked with um, employment discrimination and governance issues and um, how that was uh, affected by your ability to buy insurance coverage for those things. So the idea of how you should behave at work from a legal point of view, how having insurance against the possibility that you might behave badly at work created a sort of interesting set of questions, and then just governance and business ethics in general. Later in my career, um, I had a, a really strong interest in international. I've just sort of had a, a, a the, you know, the travel bug or wanderlust or whatever you want to call it, and a real just curiosity about the world and wanted to travel. And uh, so later in my career, when I had a little more under my belt, I had some opportunities to start teaching overseas, and that informed a new set of questions, really the same set of questions, but with a, either comparative lens country to country or a global lens how does this work as a matter of culture if you're a multi, because I'm from the business school 
you're a multinational organization and you're dealing with different standards in different places and what's the impact of that. And that's basically the type of courses that I taught to undergraduate, business students, MBA students, sometimes doctoral students, not very often given my own background, um, and law students I taught in the law school on and off uh, throughout my career as well. I miss teaching a lot. For those of you at this phase in the semester, I do not miss grading at all. So uh, that part I was <laughs> happy to put back in a file. <laughs> so, so what is the quirkiest, most unusual law that you've run across? Oh, the worst one popped into my head and I can't even tell you about okay. it. Okay, okay, all right. You know, I will say this, it was, about whether, it was about whether you're supposed to have the lights on. Georgia, where I earned my law degree, is you know, an original state. And so some of the laws are old and weird. I don't know, I would like to use a more sophisticated term to describe them, but there are very strange behavioral laws, some of which are a behind closed doors conversation, we'll say that, and some of which are about owning land and owning um, how you ran your farm, you know, and when the state was uh, originally, and still is in many parts of the state, agricultural, before Atlanta was Atlanta, and changed the dynamic of the state that are, that make no sense, you know, when you could, because of the religious underpinnings, when you could work and when you couldn't, even if it was a farm, which, is impossible to imagine, right, as a matter of running a farm, things like that. Oh, I could come up with so many, <laughs> but that would probably be more for one-on-one -on -one conversation. <laughs> <I'll> say <laughs> that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with elected officials and how you build your relationship um, with the state legislature as you've gone to different universities? Sure, so I had a, a really can't plan it kind of, can't plan for it kind of luck when I became a department chair at Florida State University because within the department where I was chair was a center for catastrophic risk research. It was the Department of Risk Management and Insurance, Real Estate and Legal Studies, which is a mouthful, and the people who studied risk, the faculty who studied risk were in that department, and they studied, because it was Florida, the risk of hurricanes and other major events there. And that was a state-funded center it was a line item in the state budget that had been in place for years, by the way, is still in place, but required that sort of tour through the Capitol during the session to say, hey, don't forget, it's good stuff we're doing. And, and so that was a nice entree because while it was a very simple conversation that was almost certainly, it was not controversial, it was not the least bit provocative, but you still did the handshake. You saw what the, what the rhythm was of working that room as a, a member of the institution, what the challenges are on your elected officials' time and attention and all the different things that they're balancing. And so that was a really good education for me. In Missouri, as a dean, I did a lot of it, uh, more than you would normally have a business school dean to. Normally, the state legislative relationship at a school like Missouri would sit with the ag dean, right? And sometimes with the engineering dean, but we had projects we wanted to do that required state funding, and there was a new law that was making that funding available. So I worked really closely with the legislature myself. I engaged my <laughs> board members and community partners to help in that effort, saw how you could create those multiplier effects really, really positively. And then in South Carolina, it's a little different because the campus sits in the Capitol so the legislators' kids and my kids go to school together. It's the same swim team, the same gym, you know, at six in the morning, and the same coffee shop immediately afterwards. And so the, uh, the nature of the relationship is relational, right, and, and community-based. We do still visit the Capitol and do the handshake meetings and talk about the priorities and ask for support in financial and other ways, but we, it is, uh, they know, we know each other, and, and that is something that would not be as obviously available from a geographic point of view, but I think is something that we try to recreate. And I do wanna mention, we also work very hard in Washington. We talked earlier about research funding and national policy and changes to Title IX, and we always wanna make sure that our federal delegation doesn't forget about what it is that the university does, needs, can do if we have their support. Thank you. What will you do to strengthen the relationship between Twin Cities campuses and the system campuses? We've had uh, lots of good conversations about that. 
I think some of it is about um, physical sitting together, making sure we're talking face to face with full re respect and appreciation for the fact that five hours is a long time, either coming to the Twin Cities or coming here, but that, and you wanna respect people's time, but if you don't do that periodically in a way that makes sense, then it becomes very difficult to maintain that sort of, hey, did you know, or oh, come meet this, this person walks through, that. wait, come meet this, I want you to hear about this, and that's often where the magic happens. I don't know what you would call that, uh, opportunity that comes with being physically present with each other. You can email each other all day long. I have running texts, you know, with the people that I work with both today, both in Columbia and on the other uh, system campuses about what's going on. Could you help me with what I heard this was happening? What's the story? There's a lot of ongoing conversation and you want to make sure that happens. But at, at the base, I think there's a certain type of um, physical presence that just has to happen in order for things to remain vibrant in the way that feeds that kind of really shared relationship. And then I think something we talked about earlier that I thought was a tremendous insight from the chancellor is to, to really think about what shared services means, right? So there are the things that we can do with economy of scale out of the Twin Cities that serve and, and become more manageable because you can look at how it affects the entire system. And some of those things are obvious, like IT, we talked about earlier, but some of them are not as obvious, like research. And I don't just mean doing the research in your labs with your students, I mean how we incentivize research too. And so I think that's part of the conversation that I would look forward to having. Great, thank you. The demographics of Minnesota and the nation are changing, both in terms of numbers and the ethnic makeup of our high school graduates. What do you think higher education, and in particular, the University of Minnesota should be doing to respond to those changes? Well, and I'll start by saying if we don't, we, if we want to be working with students, working with people in this phase of life, and being positive contributors to our community, if we don't pay attention to this demographic shift, we may not have as many people sitting in our classrooms as we would like to. And if we bring them into our classroom, we may not understand what their needs are and therefore be able to help them progress towards successful lives well lived. So I will start with the sort of, you know, warning <laughs> about the fact that we need to pay attention to what's happening in this state and in the United States in order to continue to fulfill our mission and evolve with our mission the way that the populations that we serve are evolving. So with that said, what do you actually do sort of gets back to what I was talking about earlier, which is to really think about how you engage current students and potential students with what it is that you strive to do in your mission and what you have to offer in your academic programs and community partnerships and, and uh, uh, other types of relationships. So you need to be really rethinking how you recruit the kind of information you provide the story has to be uh, receivable by the person to whom you are telling it. And if you're not thinking about that, they will go hear that story from someone else. And you need to be accessible in everything that that means. And you need to tailor your programs to create an environment for belonging and success. And that needs to be nimble enough, as difficult as it is, to evolve so that it reflects who you're serving. If you look at the demographic data, just census data, this isn't anything even more complicated than that. We're looking at 2025 is the year that people are talking about, but everyone's talking about 2025, get ready for 2025. How about 2035? And a little thought about that and real long-term planning about what it means to create sustainable mission and service across the state. So uh, there are certain best practices that are emerging, tailored, of course, to location, place, mission, attributes, capacity, but there's also a, we better pick our heads up <laughs> and look at this, or we might not need to be getting together <laughs> to talk about what's going on. I shouldn't laugh when I say that, but just to be sort of lighthearted about something really serious. Great, thank you. I have two more questions for you. Sure. And an invitation. Okay. So uh, can you give some specific examples of how you advance equitable outcomes for students through policy and practice? Mm. So one of the first things I'll say about that is we need to make sure we ask the students what they would like in terms of equity because sometimes we think we know because we are wired to be taking care of our students as 
really why we're all here, but they have their own ideas about what it means to be on a level playing field. So the first thing to do is to make sure that they're at the table for the conversation, self-advocating in a way that they feel safe doing. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that uh, that will vary according to the student and according to the campus. So some of the things that uh, we have needed to address in South Carolina, I'll just give one particular example, was students wanting to be able to indicate what name they wanted to be called, which may be different from their birth name. And that comes from two widely different point of views. So some people who are identifying fundamentally different than how they were born, and some people who go by a nickname, a middle name, it's actually culturally very common in the southeastern United States, I'll give a little cultural lesson, to have a first name that would feel like a traditional name, like Joan or Mary, and a middle name that is a family name, like a last name of a grandparent, and your nickname would be the middle name to, so that you're out of respect for elders and legacy and tradition, it's just a local cultural thing, and people won't even sometimes even think of themselves by their first name, they, because it's their family name, and they want that on their student ID, and they also may want their student ID to reflect how they have identified. And those are very, very disparate points of view with exactly the same outcome, right? But technologically required a bigger IT fix than anyone realized until uh, the registrar and the CIO you know, just blanched at the thought of how this actually worked. And so for years, it was held off by cost benefit. It's too expensive, apologize, but it's just too big of a fix. And finally saying, we gotta find money for this, we gotta find the time for this, we gotta find whatever we need to find for this. People should be called by their name, and people should be able to say what their name is. So that I would give that as a specific example, but also to reflect that they're not always what you think they are. The problem of fixing it, or the reason you have the problem in the first place, is not always what you think it is. And, and being open, receiving that, and then trying to find a way to make it, to make it work. Thank you very much. So um, we have uh, this invitation that uh, came from somebody in the audience. Every year oh. we have a celebration called the Ox Cart Days, where we celebrate as the pioneers came here bringing in oh. ox carts. And so they said, we'd like to invite you to Ox Cart Days in August next summer. Oh, And we'd thank love you. for you to be part of the parade. Oh, wow. Thank <laughs> so, you so yeah, much you. to all of you, and especially to whoever invited me to the party. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we call it friend, friend raising. Yes, so, we talked about that earlier. Good time, that good is time so lovely. Parties. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So, I want to thank all of you for coming this afternoon. And uh, we have one more kind of trick question for you. Oh, here we go. And that <laughs> is, what is the sweetest University of Minnesota campus? And why? And why? <laughs> I think Minnesota campuses are like a box of chocolates. <laughs> How about that? Thank you all very much for having that me. Was I really appreciate it. But we are going to give you the reason why we think the University of Minnesota Crookston is the sweetest. Because I know you may what's in there. Have noticed that there were sugar beets when you came I in. I did. We passed by fields of yes. them, which was great. And this is the home, one of the homes of American Crystal Sugar, which is the largest sugar processor in yes. the world. And so, and we have in here a very special, and this is like absolutely number one. Oh, the other. That fruit's getting in the way. Oh. Uh, that, that, but that fruit has a lovely history, too. So we have a chocolate oh. shop. It's called the Chippers from Widman's oh. Chocolate. Uh, it's voted always the best chocolate shop in Minnesota or the Midwest. So, And this is a generational thing. And then um, I did a very, very formal survey last summer. And I think we have the highest per capita number of Honeycrisp apple orchards or apple uh, trees in the area. And really? as you know, the Honeycrisp was developed at the University of Minnesota, yes, is which delicious. is the sweetest apple. So therefore, yes. we are so glad that you're Thank at the you sweetest Thank you all campus. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you Thank all you for much. coming. <laughs>